This is American Sign Language, or ASL for short. It's a visual language used by deaf and hard of hearing people across North America, and it's every bit as rich and fascinating as any other spoken language. For example, did you know sign language has different regional accents, just like English? See if you can guess where this guy's from. Well, I'll tell you the answer a little bit later, but there is more. What do you think this is? Yes, this is the fascinating world of American Sign Language, which didn't actually begin in America at all. In fact, to understand where American Sign Language came from, we actually need to go all the way back to 18th century Paris. Obviously. In the mid-1700s, there was a Frenchman called Charles-Michel de Lippe, who liked helping the less fortunate. Now, in France in those days, it was a bit of a rough place. Think of Les Miserables and you'll get the picture, though it was a little bit earlier than that. One day, Lippe was walking in the slums of Paris when he had a chance encounter with two young deaf sisters who communicated using some kind of sign language. When families with deaf kids figure out their own ways of signing, we call this home sign systems. They can be really quite complex and it's truly a linguistic phenomenon. Anyway, Lippe wanted to give the girls a new life, so he dedicated his life to helping them. He invented a one-handed manual alphabet and developed his own unique sign system borrowing signs that he'd learned from the deaf kids. It's now known as Old Signed French. As it goes, he started a shelter that became the world's first free school for the deaf that was open to the public. People came from far and wide and Lippe became known as the father of the deaf. Now, what's this got to do with American Sign Language, you ask? Well, as it turns out, everything. A little while later, in 1800s America, a guy called Thomas Hopkins Galloday wanted to help his neighbor's deaf daughter, nine-year-old Alice. He noticed that other kids weren't playing with her. The story goes that Galloday wrote a word hat in the sand and pointed to his hat. Alice learned the word and then he got excited and so on. So he did the most obvious thing of all. He hopped on a boat and left the country. Luckily, this wasn't just a holiday. He actually had a plan. First, he went to a deaf school called Braidwood in England, but found them teaching a rather strange method using speech. And he had to sign a contract of secrecy. So he said, Hell no, and went to France instead. He found, guess who? The school started by Lepe, who you met earlier, and convinced a star teacher called Laurent Claire to help establish a school for the deaf in America. So they set one up in Connecticut, the American School for the Deaf. Little Alice was his first student, of course, and this is where American Sign Language was born. But there was one other incredible influence on the language, and it came from a nearby island. Just off Connecticut is an island called Martha's Vineyard. You may have heard of it. In the 1800s, the island had an unusually high number of deaf people. It was thought to be hereditary deafness, affecting one in 155 people. There was even one community where a quarter of the population was deaf. It's quite an image, really, this silent world, something beautifully serene about it. So what happened? Well, the town created its own distinct sign language, and virtually all deaf and hearing people could sign. Apparently fishermen even had their own dialect, but we're not gonna talk about dialects just yet. When they heard about the School for the Deaf on the mainland, many deaf children of Martha's Vineyard enrolled at the American School for the Deaf, taking their sign language with them. And so it was inevitable that they helped shape the language. And so ASL ended up being three varieties that actually merged together. There was old French sign language, plus various home sign systems, and then Martha's Vineyard's sign language. And if you thought that was a cool story, well, I would love it if you would like this video and subscribe to the channel, because that will really help get this video in front of other people. So a happy ending to the story of American Sign Language then? Well, not quite. Not everybody was gonna like it. Remember those secretive teachers over in England? Well, trouble was brewing. But before we get to the bust-ups, let's take a step back and make sure we understand exactly what ASL actually is. If you've ever seen a sign language conversation, it might have reminded you of this. Italian uses a lot of gesture to convey meaning, but sign language is gesture, like a dance. It's whole body talking. So chances are you could pick up on the mood just by watching, whether happy, angry, dramatic, secretive, or silly. And that is a clue to how clever and complex ASL really is. And let's be clear about something. Sign language is a natural language, just like any other, because it has evolved naturally wherever deaf people needed to communicate. People have been signing for centuries. 
probably as long as spoken language. And like most languages, there is no one single version of sign language. In the US in the 1400s, Plains Native Americans were already using their own signing, and variations have been evolving for centuries. So can you guess how many sign languages there are around the world? Give it your best shot in the comments below. There are many misconceptions about American Sign Language. First important point here is that ASL is not the English language. No, it exists independently of any other language, including English. That means it's possible to have ASL as your first or only language without English being in the picture at all. It has grammar and syntax, complexities and weird little nuances, all the things that you'd have to get used to when learning a spoken language. And to put this in perspective, it is the third most studied language in the US. Now you probably know that hand signs are the foundation of the language, but there's a lot more to it. And yes, we will have plenty of demonstrations coming up a little bit later. So is American Sign Language understood around the world? No, not by a long shot, but let's start with the USA. There's up to half a million people in the deaf community who use it as a native language, but that number goes way up if you include all the family members who can also sign. And this is just awesome. Deaf creatives are representing and expressing themselves like never before, making awesome YouTube content, making history in Hollywood, meaning winning major dance contests. And remember the comedian right back at the beginning of the video? All of this is just the tip of the iceberg, but it's also important to remember all the people with mutism and certain learning difficulties, autism, apraxia of speech, cerebral palsy, Down syndrome, many of these people use ASL as well, not to mention the hearing people who learn ASL as part of their job or just to have an awesome language skill. Now, did you guess how many sign languages there are in the world today? Well, there are somewhere between 138 and 300 different types. It's impossible to know for sure. Even English countries have three varieties. But coming back to the story, in the 1800s, there was a time when sign language was thought to do more harm than good. Believe it or not, it was even banned for decades. Now, Alexander Graham Bell, yeah, that guy, had something to do with that. He traveled all over teaching a strange method called oralism, which was actually supposed to teach deaf kids to be able to speak. Thank goodness that in the 1960s, a linguist called William Stokey proved that ASL shares the essential characteristics of a spoken language, and ASL was finally declared a true language. And along with it came the very first sign language dictionary. Now, I think it's time to talk about how American Sign Language actually works. I'm gonna need some help. Hello, my name is Meredith, and uh, my husband and I own the channel Learn How to Sign, where we teach viewers American Sign Language. In a sign language conversation, the person signing is the speaker, and the person listening is the receiver. So if you are listening, you should receive signs, and you should focus on the speaker's face and eyes just as much as the hand signs, or you might misinterpret them. But since I am not a signer myself, it's my friend Meredith's turn. So Meredith, I've heard about this invisible box called your signing space. Tell us more. So whenever you are signing something, you need to keep this box frame around yourself. You're not gonna keep your signs really, really small and you're not gonna extend them out really big. Depending on maybe if you were an interpreter standing on a stage, yes, your signs would be a little bit bigger than normal, but in everyday signing, your signing space is gonna be keeping within this. And the majority of signs are going to be to keep in this area. The sign like pants, would go a little bit lower where it goes like this, but it would go down lower to your legs. Or the sign sun might go a little bit higher, but pretty much everything is gonna keep in this signing space right here. Great starting point. Then there are at least 40 different hand shapes you need to master. And to make words, you need to know something called parameters of sign. So what on earth is that? Well, think of phonemes in English. Phonemes are individual sounds that are used to build words. So in the words cat and mat, for example, the k and m that change the meaning of the word are phonemes. You've also got sounds like oo and i and qu. Think individual units of sound. These are phonemes. In sign language, these units of sounds or phonemes are called parameters, and each sign has five of these. Yes, so the parameters of sign are divided up into five parameters. You have handshake, palm orientation, location, movement, and non-manual signals. So say, let's take the sign sick. 
So our hand shape is this feeler finger. We call these our feeler fingers, our middle fingers, okay? So we have this hand shape just like this. Our feeler fingers are pointed out. And then our palm orientation is in towards our body. So we're pushing it in. Then we have the location. The location is within your stomach and your head because where you're typically sick is your head or your stomach. So, and then you have the movement with it, which is a circular movement going in towards yourself. Do you kind of see like movement like that? But then there are several signs that use what's called non-manual signals, your facial expression. And so your facial expression is going to be attached to the sign. So if I just did sick like this, it has the sign sick there, but there's not an actual meaning to it, the non-manual signals right there. So whenever you're doing that, you're putting it right here and then you're going, you're showing those non-manual signals of, oh, I am so sick. So all of those create the sign, sick. If we took out one part of it, it wouldn't make sense in that. If we had moved it down here and it was to our shoulder, that literally means nothing. So it has to have all those five parameters incorporated into the sign itself. Once you know the building blocks, it is time to start learning words. So can you show us something really simple, like, I don't know, how to count to five? One, two, three, four, and five is really, really close to what you would think it would be, but there is a change in the way your hand is gonna face. So it's gonna face towards you because when numbers one through five are just by themselves, they move this way instead of this way. One, two, three is with your thumb out, four, and five. And then six through 10, it goes forward, six, seven, eight, nine, 10. I love how 10 has a little bit of action involved in it. Other words involve more than just your hands. For example, if you're saying me, what your hand and what your face is doing are important. In this case, nothing. And if you had to do that with your thumb, well, that would not even be a sign at all. It's just like pronunciation in a language. If you want to say cat, but instead you say zat, you won't be understood. It is objectively wrong. Now, of course, languages have accents or variations, but surely sign language can't have accents, can it? Well, you might be in for a bit of a surprise later. Now, here's a question. Which hand should you use for signing? Does it matter? Yeah, so like the sign hello, I'm just using one hand like this. But if I was standing on top of a stage talking to a huge group of people, I would go, hello, 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 hello to everybody, meaning it's a bigger sign. I am welcoming everybody there. So there can be some changes to it depending on the setting that you're in, but there are plenty of signs that use just one hand. Now, most people start their ASL journey by learning to sign the alphabet. It's called finger spelling. Finger spelling is the ASL alphabet put in the form of spelling out words or titles of certain things. We actually, we have like a whole lesson over finger spelling and the reason you should finger spelling and when you should finger spell something, say for like a title of a book or something like that, that would be something that you would finger spell instead of using the sign itself, because it's a proper name or a person's name, you would finger spell that because you don't have a sign for every single person's name out there. There is what's called sign names, but those are specifically within the deaf community and people who are really connected within that group of people. But anything and everything does not have a sign because it's not actually English. It's its own language. A lot of people think like, well, what is the word for this, the sign for it in this English word? Well, sometimes you have the sign itself and then just changing those non-manual signals would then kind of change or intensify the meaning of that sign versus sick like this, uh, doing, oh, oh my goodness, I am about 
to fall over dead. I'm so sick. Like that, the, this was all that changed, but the meaning changed versus finger spelling, just the sickness that you're experiencing doesn't really push that intensity in there. It's adding those non-manual signals, but finger spelling itself is definitely needed in those proper names, titles of things, or specific things that don't have a sign. And it's just easier to finger spell. So once you know how to spell things using the alphabet, surely you could just skip the rest, right? Job done? Is it possible? Yes. Would your hand feel like it's falling off? Yes. <laughs> Would the person receiving the information be completely overwhelmed? Yes. Yeah, I thought so. No laziness allowed here, guys. You need to put your heart and soul into this. Although in this case, it sounds like laziness would actually backfire on you. Okay, Meredith, how do I spell my name then? Ollie. Nice. Now, how do you say my name is? What we call like a B-shaped hand. So it's a B is like this, or it can be like this in the form of a sign. And then you're putting it to yourself. This is I'm in possession of my name. You can do this, me. You can do my or me. My name or me, index finger, me. Okay. And then you can do name, which is two you hands on top of each other. And so make sure that they're pointed out. And then that's where you would finger spell your name. When learning a new language, a lot of methods often start by teaching the most common words and then you build on top of that. This prepares you for basic conversations. And in ASL, it's usually exactly the same. Whenever I'm doing the first class, it's alphabet. And then it's the, hello, how are you? My name is. And then it's going from there. So just like any language, we start from the very beginning of what is the basic conversation that you would have with somebody and then kind of expand from there. Now, you know how spoken languages have onomatopoeia, when the word sounds like the thing it's describing? Pitter-patter, cuckoo, beep. Well, in sign language, you have something called iconic signs. And iconic signs are where the sign uses a visual image that resembles the thing itself. For example, to say deer in ASL, you simply use your hands like this to represent antlers. Did I do that right? Now, just as a quick aside, in, in the creation of this video, we've been meticulous in our research and made every effort to get it all right, but we are totally open to correction from anyone in the deaf community. So if you feel we got anything wrong, please do let us know in the comments. We are an open book. Now, something I've always wondered, I sometimes see people speaking and signing at the same time. Is that okay? Or should you avoid the speaking part if you are talking to a deaf person? When you sign, and talk at the same time, that's called SIMCOM, simultaneous communication. And so what you're doing is you're taking those ASL signs, but you're putting them in English word order. So you're actually taking away the language side of it, the grammar side of it. And so you're not putting it in the true form that ASL is supposed to be in. ASL is a topic comment structure. So really what you're doing is you're just giving a PC information, bit of information, but we would call broken English in the form of a visual sign language. And so it's really not a language. It's now, at the same time, when you are teaching deaf kids that have some sort of auditory input, there can be huge benefits of that, which is called total communication. And so that way they're receiving information through visual language, through auditory language. So that way they're getting it all in at different levels. Um, so there are benefits of it, but it should be used um, specifically and in specific settings. Simultaneous communication in teaching ASL grammatically is really hard to get across and really hard to get your brain around the structure. What about lip reading? How does that come into signing then? So there are plenty of deaf people who have learned how to lip read. Is it common for deaf people to be expert lip readers? It's not because only 30% of the English language can actually be lip read on the lips because you're just seeing this up here. There's so much more going on in the back. So it's a big guessing game of what the person's talking about. You also have things where you have mustaches or the way people talk. Some people enunciate a little bit more. Some people keep their mouths really, really close tight. 
So it makes it extremely difficult to lip read. I know personally of deaf people who are successful lip readers, but a lot of times early on in their 20s, they start learning sign language and find it a lot easier to use sign language than lip reading itself because they're not relying on just eyes on that person's mouth. You have to think like in a classroom, when a teacher turns their head to write something on the board, that student is missing all of the information because it's all right there. Yeah, so stop worrying that people are lip reading your conversations, really. They're breaking up? How do you know? She reads lips. What are they saying now? <laughs> it's not you, it's me. Like English, ASL is a subject verb object language. So for example, I go to the shops, but it can be flexible. How you set your sentence up will depend on this. ASL, we have the topic comment structure. So for instance, we could take the sentence, the cup is on the table. Well, in English, we say the cup is on the table, but in ASL, you need to set up what the cup is actually on, the table. Then you're going to have the cup itself setting on the table. So you're going to make it to where you have to have something to build off of or the topic and then commenting about the topic or questioning about the topic that you're talking about. So a basic subject verb object sentence might be, the child loves the dog, but you can make dog the topic, dog, child, love. And sometimes the subject is repeated at the end for emphasis. So child, love, dog, child. It's really quite flexible as long as it's clear who is doing what. So we have this index finger, me, you, it, he, she, whatever you're pointing to, the possessive hand, my, your, ours, his, hers, it. Verbs are obviously really important for understanding what's being said because they describe actions. But let's take the verb to jump. Well, we can show somebody jumping. So right here is our ground, all right, the space that the person is jumping on. And then this is what we call a classifier. It's representing a person's legs. So it's this V handshake that we're putting them upside down and then here are their legs. So we've made this person. So we could have somebody just jumping, you know, but we could have somebody jumping with excitement. So you can show the different intensity movement with those non-manual signals and those extra movements within the sign itself. You could take the verb to run. Well, maybe you're explaining how I run versus how a marathon runner runs or a sprinter runs. For me, I would go, because I don't run. <laughs> but a marathon runner, they're like, they're so confident versus a sprinter. <sighs> so you're showing the difference in the style of running with those movements and non-manual signals within those verbs. Fascinating. So how would I describe my horse trotting versus cantering versus galloping? You're showing the difference of what the horse is doing because they have four legs. So now I've set them up. So you can do it all different ways. Also, it sounds like you can leave out a lot of linking words and still be understood, but that's where this other thing comes in. But for shoulder shifting for us, it's a compare and contrast. You're using something in and, but, and, or. Okay, let's say, do you like sandwiches or hamburgers? So if I'm asking somebody this, you prefer hamburger sandwich, which you? This, do you prefer hamburgers or sandwiches? This right there, is that compare or contrast structure and that I didn't have to do the word or this right here shows which one of these 
do you prefer? Do you like? Shoulder shifting is unique to American Sign Language, by the way. More on these body language clues coming up. Something has been puzzling me, though. One of the hardest things to master in many languages is tense. It's learning how to use words for past, present, and future correctly. It can be a nightmare for beginners. The sign today, just like this now, what's happening now, and I put that at the beginning of the sentence, like you just saw. But if I said something happened last week, this is the sign for week. But with ASL, you can put it back, and so it's going the week in the past. But if it's several weeks weeks ago, you can incorporate the number two weeks ago, three weeks ago, four weeks ago. And you put that at the beginning of the sentence, and then anything that you're saying after that is in that tense until changed. But if you don't give a tense, it's assumed to be in the present tense. Let's get a visual on that topic comment thing again. So if there is a time involved, now it's going to look like this. So it's time, topic, comment. Not so bad, huh? How about stress? Well, English uses stress a lot to make meaning clear. Hear what I did there? A lot. Well, that is stress, specifically sentence stress. And with American Sign Language, you stress by exaggerating your gestures. Nuances like this are intrinsic to clear communication. So let's go a bit deeper. Okay, so remember all those times that you were at a busy event and your friends on the other side of the room and you tried to communicate with them uh, across the crowd? You probably used strong facial expressions and, and gestures together to make sure they got the message, right? That is a way of signing. It's not all about the hands. A facial expression is extremely important. Whenever I am grading, videos that students have submitted in, I not only grade on the sign itself, but I grade on the facial features. Like, did you see whenever I did, which do you prefer? Because I did what's called a WH question, a who, what, when, where, why, which, how, my eyebrows have to go down whenever I'm asking that question and associating it with the sign, which, or what, any one of those WH words. So, Facial expression not only is associated in non-manual signals for the sign itself, but also for grammar as well. Aha, the question words. I was waiting for those. So can you tell us more? Let's say I wanted to ask, how are you? When you're going to ask somebody how, you're going to use these like kind of A-shaped hands and you're either going to twist one of them or you can twist both of them. So you're going to see those variations across like different regions. Some people do it like this. Some people do it like this. How or how. And then since it's a WH question, your eyebrows are going to go down with the statement. And then you're going to point to the person you. So it's meaning how you. Then if you would respond, you're going to go me fine. And if you're done with your thought, you're going to point back to yourself. But if you want to ask the person a question, what about you? You, me, fine. You, and then that person can respond. I'm happy, me. Me, happy, me. So flat hands, just like this, or you might see some people do it like this also. There are tons of these non-manual signs in American Sign Language. Moving the eyebrows, the cheeks, the nose, the head, the eyes, puffing your cheeks, shifting your body, altering speed. Almost any sign can be modified in some way. But an important part of any language is expressing yourself articulately, right? Take synonyms, for example. You need synonyms because if you're always using the same words for things all the time, then it gets boring fast. You and I, our English language, we have so many synonyms for certain words. But if we change the expression in ASL, that can then give the synonym meaning of those English words. If we have the sign scared, this is the sign for scared, afraid. But if I did this, terrified, all I did was change my non-manual signals. And then that made that word, it intensified it into its like partner synonyms. Reading and writing? Oh yes, now remember that ASL is not 
English. So if you want to write something down, you can't write it in English because that would be a different language. So how on earth do you write sign language? Well, it's not normally written, but believe it or not, there are some interesting ways that you can write. The fancier one is called sign writing. It was created in 1974 by a dancer, and it's a movement writing alphabet. It uses visual symbols to represent the hand shapes, movements, and facial expressions of signed languages. And just like we can use the Latin alphabet to write in many different languages, sign writing can be used for pretty much any sign language in the world. Another system is called glossing. This is really just used to show beginners the structure of ASL, and it looks something like this. As for reading, well, I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but people born deaf who read English are second language learners. American Sign Language is their native language, not English, and learning to read can be really difficult. There is no auditory input, Plus, the languages aren't structured the same way, but like most things, it is not impossible. This is really oversimplified here, but consider how you sometimes don't know how to pronounce a word in a book that you're reading, and yet you still know what it means when you read it. How on earth can a non-verbal language have an accent? Well, I told you this subject was fascinating, so listen on. Just as there are accents in speech, there are regional accents in sign language. For example, New Yorkers have a reputation for signing very fast. Aha, so he is from New York after all. Anyone guess that at the start? Yep, and there is even ASL slang. See, I told you this was cool. It's very much like a living language that evolves and keeps up with the trends. But how about those dialects though? Check this out. These are just some of the varieties of ASL and ASL-based creoles found around the world. In Southeast Asia, all over the Caribbean, a lot of these communities learned ASL from missionaries, and it would have been very natural for Creoles to form, but chances are you're not going to fully understand the conversation. I know this language, of course. They were saying, good morning. Here's the US version. So good morning. Notice any similarities? Well, as far as mutual intelligibility between sign languages goes, if you know ASL, you won't understand British sign language at all. French sign language, though, well, you'll actually have a decent chance on picking up of some of the nuances of what's being said, and if you were paying attention earlier in the video, you should be able to understand why. Deaf culture is vibrant and thriving. Pretty much anything you can think of that you discover learning a spoken language, well, it's there in sign culture, too. Like this. One ASL idiom that is used called train go sorry. So the train is gone, it's left the station, sorry. So what it means is you missed the information too bad, so sad, it's gone. <laughs> if I said that in a conversation with you and I, train go sorry, you'd be like, what are you talking about? But in ASL, it's left the station, you missed it. You're not gonna get it again. Personally, I felt like I probably arrived at fluency after about three to four years of university level schooling. But for each person, it can be different. It depends on how you immerse yourself in the culture and the language that's associated with that because sign language comes with their culture, uh, deaf culture specifically. And if you're immersing yourself in that, you're going to learn at a higher rate of speed and from native users. So just like any other language, immersion is key. Memorizing the ASL alphabet probably takes between 60 to 90 hours, which isn't much longer than learning an alphabet like Cyrillic, for example. And in the end, it's just like learning a spoken language. You fall madly in love with the idea, you chase it till you get it, and then you give it some attention every day. Same process. I love you. I really love you. I love you forever. So you're making friends, you're enthusiastic, you're loving this new culture, but you're a bit scared of causing offense somehow. Like, how do you know when it's your turn to speak? There are different ways. There's closing signals whenever you're done with a question. So earlier I was asking, do you prefer hamburgers or sandwiches? And then I ended with you. So I am done. I've pointed. Now I want you to answer the question. Whenever maybe you're done with a thought and you've said something and you end it with me saying, I have finished. 
There's also the non-manual markers of the head nod coming down where your thought is complete. And then you know that that next person is ready. But at the same time, you as the person who are receiving information from somebody who is signing, you have to give feedback, nodding, understanding. Because if you give nothing, they're thinking that you're not understanding what they're saying. Nodding. Oh, yeah. Oh, I get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Giving that feedback where you and I are talking, we might go, mm, oh, okay. Yeah, I get you. We're giving that feedback to the person to know that they're tracking along with us. The yeah. visual form of that. And so what would be a polite way to get a deaf person's attention? You can tap somebody on the shoulder, getting their attention, tap them on the shoulder right here. It's a neutral space of getting somebody's attention. Waving at them like this, tapping a desk because you have to feel the vibration. Like if somebody was sitting at the desk and they were down at the other end, tapping on the desk so they could feel that movement. And then when you've made eye contact with that person, you maintain eye contact with them. When you're talking to them, breaking focus like this shows that you're not interested in the conversation, that whatever you're hearing over here is more important. Now, if you're going to get a group of deaf people, their attention, you're going to flick on and off the lights to the room because you can then get everybody's attention at one time. Are there any things that we should avoid saying? Actually, the term hearing impaired or mute or disabled is something that deaf people don't want to be labeled as. They would just be labeled as deaf or hard of hearing because they don't view themselves as broken. They view themselves as a, being a part of a beautiful community with a language. Now, given, is that generalized for every single deaf person? No. Some people might have a mild hearing loss and they would just identify themselves as just having a hearing loss. But people who truly are surrounded by the culture and ASL and the language itself just would prefer the term deaf or hard of hearing. What are some ways that people can practice really effectively? Give us your best advice. So many resources online that we have now. Of course, our YouTube channel, Learn How to Sign. We have so many different videos out there, but there are also other content creators who teach American Sign Language. And you can find anything and everything just at a click of your fingertips. But then to really get into it is like once you've kind of gotten that ASL bite or whatever of finding all of this stuff online, and maybe you want to go even further and then put it into a future profession or something like that, then go and take classes at your local community college or your university, learning in a class, going to deaf events, going to a deaf church. There are so many opportunities to push yourself and to grow your skills. Now, what about top reasons for learning sign language? Why would learning sign language be awesome for anybody? Deaf people live in a silent world every day. They might go to work and never come in contact with somebody else who signs along with them. But what if you're that person to learn sign language and then to sign to that deaf person at your job or at the coffee shop or something like that, because they're day in, day out. They're surrounded by people who are talking with their mouths and not talking with their hands. And that you're that just like tiny bit of connection with that person. You can also learn about a beautiful culture and connect with some amazing people. And I mean, really open up your world to something that isn't just based geographically. It is based in a whole group of people whenever this culture around it is just across the whole entire United States as well. Not just Southern deaf people or Northern deaf people or anything like that. It's all of these different people with their variety of backgrounds, but you're connected through a language and a culture. I, I think it's just so important to have the understanding of the language and of the community itself to know in what ways can you not only better yourself, but better somebody else's day as well? 
And if you enjoyed this video, then you should definitely watch this video next. I don't know what it is, but YouTube certainly seems to think that you will like it. Oh, and uh, subscribe to the channel.